So we're kicking off today's Big Blend Radio Tourism Excellence Show with a discussion on national heritage areas and their significance in preserving and interpreting history and nature, and they often provide recreational opportunities, which in turn enhance the quality of life for local communities, for the people. And they are also, I would say, a shining example of what responsible tourism is. Don't you think, Nancy, in regards to sustainability and um, also providing a true, authentic experience for travelers because they get to see the historic sites? I think so. Mm -hmm. And I think the more we have, the better, and the bigger area they cover, the safer it is for everybody. Exactly. Um, And so they really boost the economy, too, Mm -hmm. the local economies, which means the national economy as well. the animals. Yep. They need those corridors. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have three special guests joining us today, and I'm excited because – uh, talking about national heritage areas, they are connected to the National Park Service. Mm-hmm. And yesterday, uh, the Secretary of Interior, David Bernhardt, announced, uh, this was May 23rd, that visitor spending in communities near national parks in 2018 resulted in a 40.1 billion benefit to the nation's economy and supported 329,000 jobs. And according to this annual NPS uh, report, 2018 National Park visitor spending affects more than it affects more than 318 million visitors. So they spent 20.2 billion in communities within 60 miles of a park in the national park system. Something that you and I always talk about. Exactly. There's a direct and indirect. So you're 60 miles, you know, from you know Yosemite. You're going to be affected by that income. And uh, of the 329,000 jobs supported by visitors spending, more than 268,000 jobs exist in the park gateway communities. So like we are here today, the Yuma Crossing National Heritage Area, that is going to help El Centro. It's going to help. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's even going to help Lake Havasu, where, what we're doing here. So anyway, I think we get our special guest on. We have Alan Spears, the Director of Cultural Resources in the Government Affairs Department at the National Parks Conservation Association. I encourage you to go to their website, npca.org. They are awesome supporters of the national parks, uh, in all national park units, and they really, I call them the watchdogs of the parks. Parks and uh, go to npca.org. They're also celebrating 100 years this year. So, welcome back, Alan. How have you been? I'm doing well. I was suffering because I haven't been with you guys on Big Blend Radio for a long time. Well, you know yeah, what? I fix that. We really miss you, and we yeah. miss our conversations about Gettysburg and history and you know all the good things that NPCA does. And so, we're just super happy. It's the best Friday ever to have you back on the show. And <laughs> It is, it is. You know, we've been covering a lot about Gettysburg, including being haunted. Like, have you been to the Klingel House? Have you been near there when you were there? I have, yes. And it's haunted. There's a ghost, though. <laughs> well, I'm going to send you something that's going to freak you out. <laughs> I've got photos of weird things. Yeah. But anyway, it is good to have you back on, and congratulations. NPCA, 100 years. Um, are you the oldest nonprofit, NPCA, the oldest nonprofit? In the country? I don't know about that. I do know we turned 100 last week on May 19th, and uh, we're going to be hosting celebrations, programs, service events all over the country with our members and supporters and, and friends to commemorate 100 years of impact and to launch our second century of protecting and enhancing America's national park system for present and future generations. We had cake last week in the office. That was great. I think our regional colleagues were celebrating as well. So it's a big deal, turning 100, and um we're really looking forward yeah. to launching that second century of service. Awesome. It's so good to have you back and talk about this, mm-hmm. too, because you guys do such amazing work. Um, our next guest is Lowell Perry, Jr. He is the executive director of the Yuma Crossing National Heritage Area here in Yuma, Arizona, where we are today. Uh, in fact, we could just walk right down to the river. We can walk to his office and hang out and look out <laughs> at those beautiful trees that are planted there. I encourage you to go to their website, yumaheritage, uh, dot or. Uh, is it dot org or dot com? Welcome back. How are you, Lowell? I'm great, and it's dot com. And it's, it's dot com it's, for it's some re, reason. I'm re, just so used to it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it's Go retooled, ahead. and it's retooled as well. So I, I think people will enjoy it. We think it's a lot more user friendly. Yeah, it is an awesome website, and I think um, it's really showcasing the beauty of the region and uh, the East Wetlands. You know, we love that area. Nancy and I like to walk there every time we can while we're here in Yuma. Um, But very excited. I was going to say, you know, the new executive director, but really you just celebrated a year as as director now uh, for the crossing area. Um, Are you having fun? 
Oh, I'm having a blast. And, um, you know, the people here have been so welcoming uh, in town. As you well know, I think that's one of uh, Yuma's greatest assets um, is its people. Uh, mm-hmm. Let me say real quick congratulations uh, to Alan on uh, turning 100. Uh, and, and there are a couple of uh, organizations that uh, are a little older than that. Uh, one of my previous stops with Big Brothers Big Sisters, uh, they're over 100 years old as well. So, uh, mm-hmm. but that's that's quite a quite a landmark, and and uh, congratulations on that, Alan. That's awesome. Thanks, sir. It is awesome. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I want to bring Yvonne Peach on. Uh, she is our gracious host here at the Historic <laughs> Car and Automotive Hotel, our tour headquarters, our Love Your Parks tour headquarters. She's the owner of the hotel. It's celebrating over 80 years of being in existence. That's amazing, over 80 mm-hmm. years. Awesome. Uh, I encourage you to go to her website, coronadomotorhotel.com. Also, she's the owner of the Yuma Landing Bar and Grill, and uh, that is on the same property as the hotel, and it's actually the site where the very first airplane landed in the state of Arizona, so you can check out that history at yumalanding.com. But oh, she also, wow, we're, we're getting ding-donged here. Are we in the casino? <laughs> I know. Some, it's not my computer this time. But anyway, she is also uh, the founder of the Yuma Historical Society Museum of Aviation Tourism, and it's on the site here. Uh, and she really, you go in that museum, and you're going to get a history of tourism. It's like walking back in time and seeing those old school tour guides that we had, you know, from the 40s and the 30s. It's very, very cool. Uh, but she also really interprets the history of aviation, which Yuma's had a lot of history in regards to not just the first airplane landing in the state, but Amelia Earhart flew through here, the Powder Puff Derby, all kinds of good stuff. So you can go to yumahistorymuseum.org. And on top of that, she is one of the founders of the Yuma Bird Nature and History Festival. Uh, the first annual one was in January this year, and the next one is being planned right now for January 10th through 12th uh, for 2020. So that's a big introduction, Yvonne. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing just fine. And I want to uh, congratulate Alan, too, because 100 years with any organization is really a milestone. It really is. Uh, congratulations there. Awesome. It is Thank awesome. you, Yvonne. Uh, yeah, and good to have you on the show again. Uh, you know, Yvonne's just over in another room here. You know, <laughs> she's our, our neighbor here at the hotel. And thank you, Yvonne, for putting up with us over all these years. We've been <laughs> hanging out with Yvonne and John, her husband, for what over twenty-one years now. Twenty, twenty-one years, something like yeah, that. About, yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, and our waists have been getting smaller with every year. We look younger. <laughs> <laughs> I just got to say that. I want to get into uh, uh, heritage areas on this discussion. Uh, Alan, I want to turn to you. In fact, I remember doing this quite a few years ago, uh, a segment with you. I mean, I'm going to say this was probably about seven, eight years ago we had this discussion. I can't keep track of time. But um, on what a national heritage area is. And, you know, we started to see more and more come. I remember when Yuma was like the first one west of the Mississippi um, but it seems now, isn't it like we have 49 heritage areas? Am I right on that, or is it more? It's actually 55. There were six wow. uh, that were designated in the John Dingle Conservation Act, or S-47, that got passed in February of this year. Oh. Wow. See, that's wow. a lot. So we're up to 55. Can, that's a lot. I know we're going to talk about the, the funding of that, too, uh, with this uh, National Heritage Area Act, but can you explain to the audience what a heritage area is? You know, because each unit within the National Park Service is a little different. There's monuments, historic trails, there's seashores, um, but this one is very, very unique because it's not just uh, NPC, uh, NPS that's part of it, right? Yeah, so maybe to walk into a definition of heritage areas, I'd share that they are not considered to be units of the national park system. So we've got about 419 units of the national park system. That's places like uh, Yellowstone, Yosemite, the Frederick Douglass home, those sorts of parks. Heritage areas are managed by the National Park Service. They get funding through the National Park Service, but they are not considered units. So those 55 don't contribute to that total of 419. They are designated by Congress. So Congress uh, is the body that has the authority to establish or designate these places. And the idea behind national heritage areas is that they are usually tied around one or two unique themes. They are places that have folkways, lifeways, resources, or stories that are regionally distinct but nationally significant. And so a really good Mm -hmm. example of that would be uh, a heritage area in Michigan run by my friend Sean Palmerville Size. It's Motor Cities. 
and Motor Cities uh, commemorates America's automobile culture and the mm. history associated with that. It's the innovation of automobile production over the years, uh, the industrialization that helped to promote uh, car culture in this country, but it's also about the labor history and the intense struggles that were waged by the UAW uh, and other organizations and other individuals to promote workers' rights and safety in the workplace at places like the Ford River Rouge plant. So if you go to uh, Motor Cities, you can get uh, literally a soup to nuts education on American automobile uh, history, production, um, and innovation and industrialization that supports the car culture that we have in this country right now. There are mm. other places that um, heritage areas can be small, like Augusta Canal in Georgia, which is just a couple of acres. They can also be large, like uh, Journey Through Hollowed Ground, which actually starts, you know, I've got to work it into the conversation at some point. It starts in Pennsylvania at Gettysburg and works its way <laughs> south through West Virginia and Harper's Ferry and then Maryland by Antietam and winds up in Virginia at um, Monticello. So mm. you've got something that's one heritage area that covers four states and multiple counties. So that's one of wow. the larger ones in existence right now. But they are all managed by these local coordinating entities. Lowell will tell, tell you all about this and the way that it works uh, in, in practice at Yuma. But local coordinating entities, academic institutions, preservation organizations, um, business people, leaders in the community who are interested in seeing if they can't generate a little bit more economic activity and a little bit more pride of place through developing and protecting and preserving the heritage and the stories that are important to that place. And mm -hmm. heritage areas also tend to operate in communities where oftentimes you don't have a lot of other options. So you'll notice there, there really aren't any heritage areas. I don't think I'm incorrect on this. There's, there aren't any national heritage areas in downtown Manhattan. You don't really need it. Um, there are heritage areas that border on Washington, D.C., but we don't have any in downtown Washington, D.C. But you have these places in upstate New York and Niagara Falls. You've got them in Wheeling, West Virginia. You've got them in Yuma uh, and other places where if you're able to protect and preserve resources through a heritage area and you're able mm -hmm. to empower local businesses and communities mm -hmm. to get a couple extra dollars going into their coffers because of heritage tourism generated by a national heritage area, that can make all the difference in the world in terms of empowering local communities, creating and sustaining pride of place, and protecting and preserving stories that are important, not just to those communities, but to all of us. Yes, exactly, mm -hmm. and I think Yuma is a, a fantastic example. I know uh, Nancy and I, uh, I think Yuma is the first one, and as it was mm -hmm. developing, we were really fascinated watching the story over the 20 years. Um, you know, we're, we always talk about, here's the one hummingbird bush, and, you know, uh, flower bush, you know, to I'm get hummingbirds, now. and now there's like a whole garden, you know, there's all these things. But, um, you know, we went, it was so interesting to go uh, when we were in Louisiana, uh, the Cane River Creole National Heritage Area, um, the National Historical mm -hmm. Park, and then the Cane River Heritage Area, which is, and it's completely different. And I think that's what I say about this authentic experience. National Heritage Areas go exactly with the history of that area. And the history, of course, it's going to be pro protecting and interpreting local history, but that really does touch the rest of the country and around the world because history is shared. And Lowell, you and I had a conversation about that not so long ago, about how Yuma's history touches everyone. Uh, so let's talk about Yuma and how the heritage area, um, it's, it's really a very unique place in, in that it's got nature, recreation, it's got history, it's got a downtown, it's got the arts. Um, it's, it's very unique. Now, Yuma is u unique, and, and every day I learn about uh, something new in terms of uh, its history. You know, there when the Spanish first got here in 1540, there was already a thriving uh, indigenous uh, community uh, here with the Quetzal uh, tribe and uh, the Cocopa. And so there were people living in this city before the folks arrived in Jamestown. Uh, um, you know, it's um, in the, the middle of the, the desert, yet we have uh, uh, an agricultural um, community and, and multi-billion dollar industry here that people come from all over the world to learn about how uh, we irrigate, um, you know, how we utilize technology to provide fresh vegetables for people during the, uh, the winter months. You know, when Alan's looking for a restaurant out there back east, uh, during uh, uh, December and so forth. Yeah, he's probably getting his lettuce from uh, the Yuma area. Uh, anytime you have water, you need to take advantage of it, and that was one of the the, the, the key 
things that put Yuma on the map really was um, uh, was clearing off that uh, lower Colorado River and and telling people the story about the Yuma crossing and the the, the narrows of the uh, the river here where. Uh, uh, a pivoting bridge was uh, put in place that allowed for uh, uh, railroads to, uh, to come through and truly joined uh, east with west and changed uh, the face of commerce uh, forever. We also mm-hmm. happen to be a national historic landmark, uh, which is unique uh, uh, among uh, many of the, the heritage areas. And uh, we managed two state historic parks, the uh, iconic uh, Yuma Territorial Prison, which is uh, one of the top attractions in the entire state of, of Arizona, as well as the Colorado River State Historic Park. And so we've got the wetlands areas, there are a cadre of museums, in, including uh, Yvonne's Museum uh, around the corner and the Sanguinetti House and, and all. Um, uh, we do continue to work very closely uh, with the Quisan tribe on a number of projects along the riverfront and also across the river in uh, Fort Yuma where the uh, uh, the Quisan uh, Nation Reservation is. Uh, so, there, I mean, there's just so many things that we do, whether it's conservation, whether it's historic restoration and preservation, but uh, protecting uh, our history, our heritage for future generations to mm. uh, still be able to see and touch and feel and not just read about in a book. Exactly. And and here, because of the crossing and so many people in your riverfront city, that history touches the lives of so many. Um, Yvonne, this one thing I wanted to touch on with you, uh, with the hotel, a lot of people you've seen come over uh, because of history, right? They come stay at the hotel because of, of their family visiting here or living here or, or getting hitched here, right? <laughs> That's correct. You know, the, the trend now for the, the younger people that are traveling they are really engrossed in their family history and where they got married and where they spent their vacations when they were kids. Um, they really want to travel. You know, they don't want to, I don't know, they don't want that city life. They want to see the history. They love mm-hmm. nature. And that's one mm-hmm. thing that the, the heritage area has brought. You know, we have the east and the west wetlands, and they're just absolutely fabulous. Mm. And And that's changed for you also at the hotel, right, because – I remember years ago, you know, when we were writing articles on Yuma, a lot of times everyone said, okay, Yuma is like the winter visitor, you know, capital, I know, as well as winter, you know, production of, uh, you know, lettuce and things like that. But it's changed now. I mean, if we've been here in the summer. It's the sunniest place on earth. And now there's tubing and things like that. So that's actually brought in a younger audience for you, right, because of the heritage area, uh, the river being accessible. That's correct. It used to be people would have to travel 45 miles out of town to get to the river. And now, I mean, they just go two blocks from the hotel, and they're on the sandy beaches. And, you know, they have the tubing, and they pick them up there at the West Wetlands, and they take them up. They float down that Colorado River. And, you know, we have kayaks and canoes every day coming in from out of town, you know, people that want that experience. Mm. And, and that's fun. And it's we've fun. Done it. We've done that's it, and it's fun. very cool. Uh, and really we've got cool. all the festivals, too, that happen at Gateway Park and West Wetlands Park. Um, the other thing, Yvonne, I wanted to touch on, because you've got the Yuma Bird Nature and History Festival now in its second year. Um, there used to be a birding festival years ago here in Yuma, um, and I, I don't think the Visitor Bureau does that anymore. And you decided, hey, let's do this, because you saw the need, because you have so many birders come in, but you also realized that you wanted to incorporate the history, too, that they go hand in hand. That's correct. You know, uh, we hadn't had one here for over five years, and so we were able to incorporate um, some of the um, uh, east and wet, wetlands both in, into mm-hmm. the uh, tours. We were able to do uh, Gateway Park and the Sanguinetti Park, and, of course, we uh, brought in the uh, Quartermaster's Depot down there, which is the state park. Um, the prison was part of it. We just incorporated the entire um, that's exactly what it is, Bird Nature and History Festival, because they all go hand in hand. And the the birds are just absolutely beautiful down in the wetlands, and they have grown, and you can see more and more nature down there. As the years have gone by, um, it's unbelievable for us because we couldn't even get to the river when I first came here. And, of course, John was born and raised here, and he tells stories about things he used to do years ago along the river, but... It wasn't until they did all of this restoration 
uh, for the east and west, west wetlands and where we could go down to Gateway Park that I really realized what John was talking about all these mm. years. And, and Lowell, I can see you smiling. I know you're just two blocks from us, but I can see you smiling all the way here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and uh, we uh, participated with Yvonne with uh, last year's uh, Bird Festival, and we'll be doing so again. And, you know, a lot of the work that's been done with um, of the wetlands area uh, has contributed to uh, previously endangered species making a comeback and, and nesting in the area, such as the uh, uh, yellow-billed cuckoo that we just found uh, recently, uh, Ridgeway's rail, uh, southwest willow fly catcher, among others. And um, uh, it's a great place for, for birders, people that want to fish, that want to just go out and hike, uh, enjoy nature. Uh, we're actually um, one of the things we're going to be embarking on uh, after uh, – an award from uh, Arizona State Parks and Trails is, is installing what's called the um, uh, Sunset View uh, Wildlife uh, Area, where we're creating another overlook and uh, viewing area that uh, I think will be uh, popular uh, with our friends that, that do like to go out. And In fact, our, uh, our manager of the area, uh, VNA Avila, uh, we were just on a uh, kind of a, a drive around and, and talking about different things, and she uh, recently led a tour of some people uh, out in the area, and they saw uh, over 30 species of birds uh, wow. there, which is uh, is pretty incredible when you think about it. So uh, mm-hmm. we're we're excited about that, and you do see that kind of life that uh, uh, Yvonne spoke about in terms of uh, people coming down, families uh, on the riverfront, and uh, making. Uh, best use of uh, that water, and we're always looking at ways to continue to enhance that experience. Uh, at at some point, we'll be looking at uh, a zip line in the area and some other things to add cool. some grills and maybe some some bird's eye views, if you will, of the entire wetlands area. Uh, that uh, we've got some some plans in in, in place as we continue to do, um, you know, the the, the basics that. Um, have gotten us to where we've done now, essentially over 550 acres of, of riverfront parks and uh, wetland conservation habitat. And, um, you know, if you look at uh, the entire span between the west and the east wetlands, there is a uh, kind of a contiguous riverfront trail system of a little over three miles. So uh, you can walk along there. I've seen people with some of those recumbent bikes going along the the trails and that kind of thing. So it's it's great for outdoor recreation, for just overall health um, mm. and, and uh, welfare of the community. And i got to bring up that the fact that the beavers are back, and mm. they never used to be out in the West Wetlands area, and now we see them in the West Wetlands and, and the East Wetlands. And you and see, some, yeah, yeah it, it's, it's I, cool. oh, yeah. we go out there. I never knew yeah. that I would know how to spot a beaver by listening and but you do you you start yeah. you, you walk them. you can hear them chomping and <laughs> now i know yeah you know, oh yeah, getting yeah. Two beavers now, <laughs> yeah now, now like, we'll let people know that it, it, it's not like in the movie narnia none of these beavers talk you know so yeah. at least none that i've run into yet but uh um, yeah, i mean you never <laughs> no, know well, you talk <laughs> <laughs> because we do have plenty of stories about ghosts and all that you've already mentioned, you know, about uh, Alan and, and, and hanging out with the ghosts out there in, in Gettysburg. Uh, there's, there's quite a, uh, a number of stories uh, throughout the downtown uh, area, uh, many of the historic buildings and all. And uh, we had, I think, at least six uh, uh, film crews come in this past year to the prison uh, to do uh, ghost stories, you know those guys with the running around with the night vision. And did you hear that? Did you hear that? You know, I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, it uh, definitely uh, was. Yeah, it, 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 yeah, it's a it's a popular place. And you know, hey, look, I got to tell you, I mean, it, I'm I'm sitting in my office, and and this building is going to turn uh, 100 uh, next year. It's the old city hall, and you know, I've been in here late mm-hmm. night sometime when I'm by myself, and you know, I've I've heard some things. <laughs> You know, so. <laughs> it's the creature from the Black Lagoon so, is going to come out. It's going to come walking out. I love it. I love it. Alan, um, I want to yeah, turn to yeah. you on this because, you know, Yuma is such a, a, it's a success story. And you hear, you know, um, you know, these continuing projects and improvements that are happening now. 
Um, you hear Yvonne's story of how it's helped her business. We know for a fact it's just, you know, we can't wait to get here every time so we can go walk the riverfront. And now they, mm. I, I'm sorry, but you have a forest here, too. I mean, there's mm-hmm. all these cottonwoods, and whenever I take photos and put them up, New people trees. are like, that's mm-hmm. Yuma? I had no idea. I've, you mm-hmm. know, bit by bit we see people that normally drive by and just get gas because it's right off the interstate are now going, I need to come to Yuma. So this is something I think that's very impactful on the economy side. Um, But isn't that, you know, that's part of the importance of heritage areas, Alan, but there's also we need to back up the heritage areas, right? Don't we need to help them? Well, yes, absolutely. So we've got a couple of things that are pending right now that could provide the program with uh, the kind of relief and support that it deserves and that it needs. You know, when we talk about all the things that are going on in Yuma, those are just some of the reasons why NPCA really strongly supports the National Heritage Area Program. You've got some common sense preservation methods that are going on here. They are very agile uh, and able to connect and partner with people that maybe the National Park Service couldn't quite get to, or at least not as quickly. And the economic benefits of heritage areas are well proven. We Mm -hmm. talk about the economic benefit report that was just um, uh, released by the National Park Service for 2018, but the National Heritage Area Program collectively, they've been responsible for supporting and sustaining 148,000 jobs, generating about $12 billion in economic activity, $1.2 billion in uh, tax revenues, and this is coming from collectively the 49 national heritage areas. We don't have numbers for the six new ones that were just added. But the ways that we want to support the program are through the passage of the National Heritage Area Program Act. It's H.R. 1049, currently pending in the House. It's a bill that was introduced by Representatives Tonko and McKinley, who are respectively uh, Democratic and Republican congressmen who are the bipartisan co-chairs of the House Heritage Area Caucus, representing the states Mm. of New York and West Virginia. And they are moving H.R. 1049. We've already had a legislative hearing before House Natural Resources, so that was a good thing that happened last month in April. And we're due to get a markup before this committee, um, before the end of the calendar year, and we'll hope to see the legislation move. What H.R. 1049, the National Heritage Area Program Act, does is it creates a system of national heritage areas. No such entity currently exists. It's just those 55 that are out there, they've been established and uh, Each one has a different enabling uh, legislation or or enabling bill. And so managing the the funding and the assessment uh, of these heritage areas can be an incredibly complicated thing. It's complicated for Congress, it's complicated for the Park Service, and it's complicated for people like Lowell that are trying to run the programs with clear understandings of their benchmarks and performance measures. So creating a system will take some of the frustration and the train wreck nature out of that. Um, And so we want to see that bill passed. We've got 105 co-sponsors, strong bipartisan support. We don't yet have a bill in the Senate. So we need to continue to work with our Democratic and Republican colleagues in the Senate uh, to see if we can't get a bill introduced in that chamber as well. So the Mm -hmm. legislation is one avenue of approach for supporting heritage areas. The next thing is we've got to work on the budget. Uh, the FY 2019 budget for National Heritage Areas is about $20.3, $20.5 million, um, and that number has stayed in roughly the same area for maybe a decade. Uh, wow. We've gotten it up from about $18 million, but that's um, every time you add new heritage areas and you don't increase the budget, you've got more people um, trying to get a slice of that too small pie. So the good news is for the FY2020 uh, House Appropriations Report language that just came out this past week, it does look like heritage areas are um, projected to receive, we need to see if it stays, but projected to receive about a $1.5 million funding increase. Now, that's not a lot of money, but what that does is it at least Mm -hmm. allows those six new uh, heritage areas that were designated in February to get a little stand-up money independent of the existing budgets of um, places like Yuma. So Mm -hmm. nobody's got to take any money from Lowell if this money remains in the budget in order to get themselves stood up. That's a good thing. But NPCA is actually recommending a $32 million annual budget for the National Heritage Area Program. That is a, a tough ask in a fiscally conservative environment, but it would allow all heritage areas to continue with their operations and uh, 
to allow for the new heritage areas and maybe a couple of others that would be added to the National Heritage Area system once we get the bill passed to get enough money to actually do things that are uh, positive. And one mm-hmm. of the things I want to explain to you and, and people who are listening to this program is the money that the Park Service provides to heritage areas like Yuma, it's done on a one-to-one match. So for every dollar Lowell gets from the federal government, he's got to match it with a state, local, or private source. So that's a lot of hustling that has to be done to convince people to support the work that he's doing. And, in fact, most heritage areas are matching at a three-to-one rate of return, some as high as five-to-one. I think there are a couple that are up there at seven or eight-to-one. So it's an incredible return on the, of the federal investment. Um, but when you get that money coming in from a state, local, or private source, most often they want to make sure that their money is going to get kids on a school bus to pay for the plants that are going to be um, put into the system uh, to pay for books and materials, educational outreach, other things like that. They're oftentimes very reluctant to pay for salaries and overhead. And so the federal dollars tend to pay for salaries and overhead because if you don't have an executive director to run Yuma, you don't have the programs and the success that Yuma is, um, has mm-hmm. created for itself and for the community. So what we need to do is to ensure that the federal funding remains in place, that there are no cuts to that, and, in fact, that it's increased so that uh, our heritage area colleagues have a better ability and more, more stability and maybe have to worry a little bit less about making sure that they can pay themselves and take care of their staff and provide benefits and even paper clips, because that's important. Right. If you want to run an operation, these are small businesses, essentially. And in order mm-hmm. to run a small business successfully, you need to have some mm-hmm. a stable in, in infusion of capital to make that possible. Right. And I know, Lowell, when, when I met with you in your office, you had that big diagram of all these you know, I, I can't. It's not even a. It's not a roadmap, but it's like, uh oh, <laughs> it's, it's like all these different, yeah, yeah, you know, no. funding caps, right? So it's almost like you're well, fighting with your neighbor to get that dollar, right? I mean, we've got the new ones in Santa Cruz County, um, in in Arizona here, yeah. but it's almost like if you don't get that help, you're 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 yeah. Well, you know, uh, yeah, Alan Alan used the term train wreck, and and because you know, you get all these different heritage areas with different what we call sunset dates where your authorization is scheduled to expire. Uh, you've got people coming at all these different times and, and all, and if we can, can make that uh, better coordinated, more standardized, it's going to create, I think, some enhanced ability, sustainability for heritage areas. It's going to benefit legislators because they're not going to have to go at it alone for their individual heritage area. Now, if we're looking at it as an entire group, as an entire body, and and it's important for people not to forget some of those figures that Alan threw out there earlier about the billions of dollars of impact mm. uh, into economies across this country. You know, we're we're part of the economic engine here, and so it's an investment. And on a, an average, five and a half dollars to one. I don't know about you, but if somebody came to me and said that that was the kind of return I could get for making an investment, I think most people would would take that mm-hmm. bet. And you know, and, and it's and it's important for us to to not sit and maintain the status quo. You know, we need to be able to grow organizational capacity. I mean, these programs don't magically run themselves. You know, people, you know, in the nonprofit sector tend to talk about, oh, you know, well, we just want to pay for programs. We don't want to pay for operating. Well. You know, how do you think the programs actually take place? So if you can't attract and keep good people so that you can do more in your Mm. uh, individual Mm. heritage area or or whatever you're doing, uh, then, you know, it it really doesn't doesn't make any sense from a business perspective. And I'm glad Alan mentioned the fact that these are small businesses. That's why I don't refer – I'm not a fan of the term nonprofit. I prefer uh, social profit because there is a profit in the work that's being done. And I encourage uh, people who are listening today to, to reach out to their, their, their congressmen and their senators and say, look, I, I support the uh, National Heritage Areas Act of, of 2019 as it is uh, proposed and, and written because of the value that it brings to communities. And, you know, that's how things get done in this country. They have to hear from us. They have to hear from the, the, the people because they're there as as representatives. And if they're not hearing that, then, you know, it, it makes it a little more difficult. So, you know, don't just hear this show and, you know, not go online and, and, and find out how you can learn more about, you know, 
on who to reach out to in your communities and that kind of thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's there and, you know, our young people deserve it. Cause at the end of the mm-hmm. day, for me, this is still about kids, you know, I mean, yeah. when you're talking about history, and, you know, uh, this is an educational movement as well as just conservation and historic preservation. It looks, last time I heard, uh, um, history was a, an academic subject. And if we're contributing to that, if we're getting people interested in those kinds of things, we're exposing them to new industries and new potential uh, career paths and that kind of thing. I mean, there's just so much that's wrapped into this uh, seemingly complex uh, organism that's called uh, the, the National Heritage Area um, uh, uh, group uh, that uh, we would be uh, totally uh, doing our kids a disservice if, if we don't pay a little closer attention and understanding the value that uh, that we bring to our local mm-hmm. communities and uh, the opportunities that are often cast out in front of um, uh, some young person that uh, uh, is leaving uh, Yuma High School or, or COFA and, and going to uh, AWC or Arizona State or University of Arizona, Northern Arizona, so forth, uh, that uh, they're, you know, being exposed to some things that mm-hmm. could allow them to, to maybe be uh, significant in the future. I, and you've made it fun. And one thing you just recently did, I saw that on Instagram. And you guys, thanks for always keeping me posted on that because – you guys are doing something all the time, and, um, you know, you've got, like, the, the Kids Museum over at the Colorado River State Park that happens during the summer. Uh, so you're getting the kids involved, but you're also putting uh, the literature into Spanish because here's the thing. It's, mm, it's, it's our history is from all walks of life and cultures, so it needs to be all-inclusive. Mm-hmm. And I see you making strides in that in that department. That's so important. Well, I think that's important. No, Absolutely. I mean, you you have to to open up that broad tent and, you know, history doesn't have to be boring. It should be fun. And so we're uh, looking at ways to uh, create new, more interactive uh, exhibits and and highlight a a broader swath. And, you know, you Mm -hmm. mentioned the uh, brochures in Spanish and and all. We're uh, some of our uh, uh, interpretive signage uh, in our parks is is being updated to be reflective of that as well. We created a Hispanic advisory council uh, to figure out how to to better engage uh, the local Hispanic uh, community and and integrate them into the the, the process of uh, what it is that we do here on a daily basis. There have been contributions of African Americans in this part mm-hmm. of the country. I recently, uh, and we're looking at, at ways to, to highlight that. The Dees family, uh, Alex Dees, uh, you know, one of the top ranchers uh, here, award-winning uh, raiser of cattle and, and so forth, that's been doing it for over a hundred years in this mm-hmm. this part of the country. And so, uh, there, there's just so many things that can be put out there uh, for everyone uh, that uh, would be an af- absolute travesty if, if some of these things uh, are lost. You know, mm-hmm. uh, so it's it's just it's, it's exciting. It's a lot of fun. I mean, we've spent a lot of time uh, because you know. Uh, just enhancing uh, our messaging so that people understand, you know, who we are as a heritage area, uh, more intentional uh, branding. We've you know, updated our logo, our website, and we do a quarterly news uh, letter that, you know, we invite people to, to sign up for and it, it increased our presence on uh, social media as well. I mean, that was one of the things mm-hmm. that I learned uh, as part of my initial due diligence here that, that uh, we needed to, uh, expose more people to uh, what we do, who we are, and more importantly, what we're achieving, what our value is uh, in the area. And that, the, uh, again, diversity and inclusion is important because when you think about it at the end of the day, who built most of this country? You know, people yeah. of color, whether, okay. whether voluntarily or otherwise. And, mm-hmm. and so, you know, um, I don't think that there's been the kind of intentional outreach to uh, include uh, uh, more African Americans and, and Hispanics and indigenous uh, populations into the conversation of how this story needs to be told. You know, mm, people I'm... need to understand. I mean, look, you have you have somebody like Alan doing what he does uh, in a in a a, uh, a a sector that you don't see uh, mm-hmm. folks that look like Alan and I. You know, mm-hmm. so um, you know, I just got back from a 
uh, a, a national heritage area, our alliance of national heritage areas uh, meetings. And, uh, you know, that was one of the topics of discussions on how we can get uh, the heritage areas to be more intentional around that and inclusive and in what mm. their boards of directors look like, the leadership looks like, and, and all so that we can have uh, uh, people whose histories we're out here trying to tell um, uh, locking arms and aims to make sure that our young people are getting um, the, the stories that they deserve to hear and see. I'm glad you said that. I know, Yvonne, you're jumping for joy on this, right? Because you've been, yes. I remember, um, you, you know, talking about families coming here looking for African-American history. Um, and then Steve Schneider, and you sat down and put a list of all the film history that was here. Yes, right? yes, we did. And you have the film history and uh, the prison. I believe that we did, too. And, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it was to incorporate that because it had been something that was asked of us um, before in the past. Mm-hmm. And so we were actually going to um, add it to our uh, bird festival this year, uh, you know, wow. uh, uh, one of the classes that we have. Awesome, awesome. And I also wanted to touch on the youth. Are you seeing, because of obviously the river, um, but are you seeing, um, you know, multicultural visitors coming here? I mean, we're getting people from all over the world. I know when we're here, there's, you know, you don't know who's speaking what in the parking lot. You're like, dude, is that German or is it what? No, is that from Czechoslovakia or Czech Republic? What What are they talking about there? <laughs> you know, so that's I, I a really cool mm-hmm. thing. But uh, yeah. you have a Hispanic community that comes here too to the hotel, right? Yes, we do. We have Hispanic, mm-hmm. and we have all cultures. Uh, you know, we have probably have over 30 countries represented here a year through the hotel. Um, yeah, it's very international. and uh, But, you know, like I said, the, the culture uh, needs to be taught. It needs to be – there's history there, and I think it's very important that uh, we capture that. Mm-hmm. And are you getting young mm-hmm. people here? I mean, also uh, families um, and then, like, a younger – Audience coming in here, or audience. I'm so used to that. Oh yeah, uh, but younger. Yes, we get a lot of people in. with children. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's ever since the river has been um, restored the way it is, uh, mm-hmm. you know, even like the West Wetlands, we talk about the burning, but they have one of the largest playgrounds in the state of Arizona over there, and it's all handicap mm-hmm. accessible. That is amazing for people that have children that are traveling. Mm-hmm. See, that's really cool, and I mm-hmm. wanted to go to, from that. Back to Alan, because and I, I actually believe we just talked about you on a show, and I think it was a Gettysburg interview we did. Uh, it was with Jim Schlett, the artist, uh, mm-hmm. artist in residence there, because we interview artists in residence at uh, Gettysburg, I'd say about two to three to four, five times a year. And um, mm-hmm. and, I, and he did have weird things from the ghost. Yeah. <laughs> I saw the photos, and it's weird. But um, I was talking about you, and they were talking about the importance of youth going to Gettysburg and youth getting involved. And, and I was like, well, if it, you know, look at Alan Spears. He, he, your whole career started from you as a kid going to Gettysburg, right? So that's the importance of parks. Sometimes we've got to remember, too, you know, kids see park rangers, and, you know, they're rock stars. <laughs> so that kind of happened for you, huh? Yeah, I, I also think it's kind of an investment that uh, can't demand a return immediately because um, I've spent a lot of time walking around national parks and places I love like Gettysburg or the Frederick Douglass home, and invariably whenever you see a tour that involves school groups, there's one kid that's just not getting it. There's one young person, one young man or young woman who looks like they just would prefer to be any place else on the planet other than where they are right there. But mm-hmm. You can never tell when the how the experience that you're providing for that person in that on that particular day in that particular time might still be able to plant a seed. And um, you know, when I started working for NPCA in 1999, 20 years ago, um, I wasn't really fully aware of the extent of the national park system. Had never heard of the National Parks Conservation Association. Was looking for an internship that paid well and. Uh, a place where I would be treated with respect in the workplace and be able to work on challenging things that meant something to me. And so NPCA really fit that bill. But um, mm-hmm. it was great because then I sort of was able to open up the my own interior attic and draw upon some of these experiences as a child growing up in Washington, D.C. and southeast across the street from Fort DuPont, which is an old Civil War fort, part of the Fort Circle system of national parks in Washington, D.C., 
But for me, Fort DuPont was the place where my friends and I went over and played war. It was where we had snowball fights. It was where I walked my dog. Oh. Um, and it was where I probably stole a lot of frogs and snakes and other things like that. And if I'd come across a park ranger, they would have had to put me under arrest when I was, you know, 12 or 13 years old. So I'm happy that didn't happen. Um, but it was still something that planted a seed. And if you had talked to me at the age of 13, I wouldn't have been able to articulate that I am developing an environmental awareness. I am developing a, a historic preservation uh, sense of stewardship. That's just having fun. And mm. so I think making sure, as Wool was talking about and as you were all talking about, ensuring that these places are around for the next generation and the generation after that, and not just around, but around in pristine condition, well-managed, well-funded, well-cared for, and well-loved. You never know when you plant that seed, when it's going to germinate. And there's a very mm. good chance, or at least I like to think there is, that that one kid who's on a field trip to Gettysburg today and just not getting it, not liking it, there's always a chance they're going to be Secretary of the Interior or Director of the National Park Service in 20 or 30 years because that seed is still being planted. So I think mm. we just have to make sure that our parks are around. We're 100 and something years into the investment on national parks already. So we have already made a commitment that these places mm. are important to us. The American people have done that. Citizens mm. of the world have done that. So it's too late to go back on that pledge right now. And what we need to mm. do is make sure we incorporate heritage areas into that network uh, into that context and make sure that that program is well-funded, well-respected, and well-cared for, and that Lowell's work will be around for generations to come. Exactly, exactly. Well said on that because I think you're right. You know, uh, number one, America started the National Park Service. And, you know, all the parks we went to in Africa and, and you know, lived in even, um, mm -hmm. those parks wouldn't have been there. That we are, this country started it, you know. Uh, so it's really an, an honor and we need to keep that. That's something to be very proud about, you know. Um, it's it's really an amazing program, the National Heritage Area Act. Everybody, uh, that's something we can all do. It's H.R. 1049. Um, Alan, real quick before you go on that, is there a place on MPCA website or anything that um, should they go through the uh, National Heritage Alliance, uh, Heritage Area Alliance website or do they just go right to their Congress people? Uh, well, uh, you can check on the NPCA website. We should have some good background information mm -hmm. about H.R. 1049 and on the significance of national heritage areas. And um, I think it's a good program. And you can also look uh, for your individual heritage areas. Lowell gave the address for Yuma Crossing, but there are 55 of these things. And each of them should have an individual website if you want to learn a little bit more about the programs and opportunities that exist there. The National Park Service also has a Heritage Area website. Of course, they manage the program, and so you can check there. And for the people who are very sophisticated in terms of their politics, you can always go on congress.gov, congress.gov, and you can type in HR 1049. It will bring up the text of the legislation, and it will bring up the co-sponsor count. And if you look on that mm -hmm. co-sponsor count, 105 strong, and don't see your uh, congressperson on that list, you can give them a call or send an email and tell them they need to get on board. And go knock on their door. That's the other thing, you know. There's picking up a phone, knocking on the door, handwritten notes too, man. It's like, you know, we we got to keep it, having that conversation with our Congress people, mm. all of our representatives of all levels. We need to keep talking and um, showing face too. You know, any kind of town hall meeting, go <laughs> and stand up and take your list. <laughs> take your list because you should have a list. We all have a list, I believe. So, um, but very good. Again, it's HR 1049. Thank you so much, Alan. Everyone, again, the NPCA website is npca.org. They're on Twitter as well, Facebook, Instagram, all those great places. Sign up, become a member. Uh, they have an awesome magazine, and uh, they're just really one of the best organizations on the planet. So, npca.org again. Thank you so much, Alan. Thank you. And also, uh, Lowell's website again is yumaheritage.com, and go check it out. You'll see how beautiful Yuma and the National Heritage Area is, the East Wetlands, the downtown. Again, yumaheritage.com. Thank you so much for joining us, Lowell. Hey, it has been my pleasure, and especially, you know, you mentioned this National Road Trip Day. I think what you and Nancy do is, is so cool, you know, this this kind of year-long road trip. And uh, I think I shared with you but one of the best experiences I've ever had uh, was when my oldest son, Trey, and I uh, took a road trip from Seattle to Nashville, and we drove through Moab and Utah and you know, Idaho and through the Rockies and all that. And so it's one of the greatest times I've ever had, and I encourage people to – 
you know, while you still are able to do that, do that with your young folks. Exactly, sure. exactly. Talk about bonding. Absolutely. You know, especially when you're all in that car together, you're going to have to play some games. You're going to have to have that conversation. <laughs> uh, it's a great way to... There's always somebody who can't sing. Yeah, and, and there's always someone who yeah. has to keep going for the bathroom break, yeah. but that makes it fun. Yep. <laughs> so, yep. There you go. So I love road trip. I mean, that's we're on a permanent road trip for the rest of our lives, but we're really thankful that Yvonne here at the hotel, her and John, uh, you know, they keep seeing us. We come in, we have our wine time, and uh, we really appreciate staying here because it's like, you know, when we need to get down and get to work, we've got, you know, beautiful historic hotel. It's real. It's got all the modern stuff we need. And, you know, we can walk down to the heritage area in the morning. So thank you so much, Yvonne, and thank you for, for being sure, on the Yvonne. show today. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. Nice and meeting you, you and talking you to Alan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, absolutely. Yes. And I'll see you all later on. Yeah, yep, just on the street. <laughs> just down Here the street. Is, I'm going to have to come over them. there and get some fish and chips. That's right. Get fish and chips over it's there. It's Friday. At, at, it's uh, Friday. Corn. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's right. Mm-hmm. Uh, everyone, CoronadoMotorHotel.com is the website. From there, you can go to Yuma Landing. And uh, also, don't forget, the Yuma Bird Nature History Festival is happening in January. And uh, you got to go. It's really cool because it, it really does incorporate everything. And that's uh, January 10th through 12th, 2020. And you can go to the website, YumaBirdNatureHistoryFestival.org. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, we're going to play a song. It's called Colors of the USA. It is written by Doreen Taylor. And actually, Doreen connected to NPCA through being one on one of our shows, and this song was created in, uh, with, with NPCA for the National Park uh, to honor the centennial of the National Park. So we got to play it today. That's right. So uh, it, go to DoreenTaylorMusic.com to learn more. So here it is. Thanks for joining us, everyone, and have a safe and happy long weekend. <laughs> 